Last class, we were uh, talking about a, uh, an, using an example of <clears throat> the, sort of the situation in Romans 1, 2, and 3, and we um, were likening that unto the story of David and Absalom. <clears throat> and in our last class, we went through a certain portion of scripture that showed that uh, Absalom was a son, he was in the family, <clears throat> he was in the lineage of David. <clears throat> he, um, he had everything right, but he wasn't flowing in oneness with David. He wasn't. He, he had his own beauty and he had his own life and he was capitalizing on that for himself and it ended up uh, causing him to um, raise up a rebellion <clears throat> against David, and it's interesting that the wording, the wording is always when it's Absalom and it's talking about David, it says David and the king, never David and his father. So he is, he has no, it's as if he doesn't have any real understanding of the depth of his rebellion to his father. He's just rebelling against, you know, well, I want to have, I want to do things for God. I want this or that. I want glory. I want, you know. <clears throat> and I tell you that a lot of Christians fall into that category. And they may mean well, but they are taking away from something that actually belongs to Jesus. And so anyway, we discussed that. And then we got to chapter 18. And in chapter 18, we found that <clears throat> uh, Joe, uh, Absalom was slain. Uh, this is uh, 2 Samuel 18, verse um, 14, and also verse 15, where Joab slew Absalom. <clears throat> he tried to get another man, or he was telling another man, why didn't you do it? And he said, because the king, I heard what was in the king's heart, and he said not to do this. You know, there's two, two forms here. One form is a respect for the king, and another form is that if you actually hear the heart of the king, a respect for the king can, or for Jesus uh, can keep you from doing certain things. But to know his heart will not just keep you from doing things, it will keep you with him. And that's a big difference. That's a big deal, folks. It's not a big deal to us, really. It's a big deal to him. It should be a big deal to us. But it is, and it will always be a big deal to him because to him, it's not just about following him as a religious leader or as a king. It is being of his seed and being of his kind. And that's, you deal with him, that's him. You know what I mean? That's just, that's him. So anyway, so Joab slays him and... Um, and then... Um, We'll go, we're still in 2 Samuel 18. <clears throat> we'll go over to long about verse uh, 30, 31. And uh, what's prior to these verses is that um, the, this, this battle began, had begun already and was going, and it was the battle between Absalom's men and David's men. And David <clears throat> was not there. He was back. Um, at, I, I doesn't really say, but he was not immediately in that situation. And so they had runners that would keep um, David and others informed. And so this one runner comes and he doesn't really, you know, he, you know, he's supposed to run with a message and there's a whole teaching on all of that, but I'm not gonna touch on it right now. But he doesn't really have the message. All he has, all he knows is that there's a big battle going on. But, but there's another messenger that does have the message, and he runs. <clears throat> so David turns aside the first messenger, and the second messenger comes, and that's where, um, <clears throat> verse 31, and behold, the Cushite came, this is the second messenger, and the Cushite said, tidings, my lord, the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day of all them who rose up against thee. Okay, so the message is of, as it were, things are going well, there's victory, because all the people who rose up against the king, 
are being defeated. But there's something else on the king's heart. And, um, and it's hard for people to understand this because it's not, it's not just about Absalom. It is the king's heart. And this story will help us to understand the heart of Jesus if we, if we grasp it. Because all we see is that, well, he loved Absalom. And, and you know, there's so much more to this. <clears throat> so when this messenger says, you know, everybody's being defeated. All those who rose up against you are being defeated. David speaks where his heart is, where, what, what's his issue. And the king said unto the Cushite, is the young man among them Absalom? Is that, or, or is the young man, Absalom, safe? All right. This is the kid who basically spent years undermining the king. This is the kid who would not see the king's face. This is the kid who wrought a rebellion against the king, his father, in every case, his father, his father, his father. This is supposed to be of one seed. And all David can do is ask, but is Absalom safe? This one that has just stolen the hearts of the people away from a man that would get them to the Lord. <clears throat> And the Cushite answered, The enemies of my lord the king and all who rise against thee to do thee harm be as that young man is. Meaning that he's, he's dead. And the king was much moved. Much moved. And went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O oh my son, Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh Absalom, my son, my son. All right. <clears throat> David goes into deep mourning, um, he is, um, he is not just mourning his death, he is mourning the fact that he would have let Absalom kill him, he would have died in place of the one who is in total rebellion. Um, that spirit is understood by a very few. Um, and so we're going to see uh, Joab's rebuke now, beginning verse 19. <clears throat> I mean, sorry, chapter 19, verse 1. And it was told Joab, Behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people. For the people heard that day how the king was grieved for his son. And the people went by stealth that day into the city, meaning they're returning now from being run out. And the people went by stealth that day into the city as people being ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. But the king covered his face and the king cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son, Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. All right, so um, victory is being turned into mourning. Let me tell you something. When it comes to Christians, anything that has to do with victory, that's what they want. It's got to look like victory. It's got to feel like victory. It's got to be. It's got to be power. It's got to be, you know, 
glory in the battle and all of this stuff. And David is going to manifest a spirit again that is just not understood. It's, it's not understood by very many at all. And he's going to he's going to do what we think is right. But we're going to see that the action he takes is Joab as Joab always is. He does not understand the spirit of David. He does not understand the man's heart. And many of us have read this story and we've sided with Joab because we don't understand the Lamb of God. We don't understand that the, he, Jesus could have had victory out of victory, but he brought victory out of death. And he turned victory into mourning so that there would be a true victory. He died. He took the death of every one of us. And, and in, in Romans, all that turned against Jesus, he, went, he just went and took their death. He took their punishment. He took it all in. And he didn't want victory. Jesus didn't want victory in the way we want victory. He took defeat, total defeat. There was no victory. He didn't rise up with a sword and wipe them out as we call victory. We sing songs of the victory of the Lord, but the victory of the Lord was his defeat. His willing sacrifice for those that he loved and those that had deserved all of this. All right, so, and, and that lamb is the one who turns things in another direction. If you don't know the lamb, if, you, if you've heard the teaching, but if you don't know the lamb, you're going to side with the Joabs of the world every time, and you're going to think they're right. All right, so let's go on with the story. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so verse 4 was, but the king covered his face, the king, and the king cried with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Verse 5, and Joab came into the house to the king and said, Thou hast... Uh, thou hast covered with shame this day the faces of all thy servants who this day have saved thy life and the lives of thy sons and of thy daughters and the lives of thy wives and the lives of thy concubines in that thou lovest thine enemies. Thou lovest thine enemies. Who does that sound like? I don't know about us. I don't know about us. I don't know about you and me, but I know Jesus loves his enemies. I know he does because I was one of them. And I wasn't kind of one. Neither was Paul. He was, he was an enemy of the cross. He was the enemy of Christ. And God made him an apostle. He didn't just save him. God said, I'm going to do, I'm going to do exceedingly abundantly. And he took that man and he didn't save him. He saved him and made him an apostle. And then gave him his own heart. The Lord gave Paul his heart. And that man, Paul, never got over that. You can, there are places you can read it where Paul goes there. He goes to that place. He never got over it. He never, he never, it was like it crippled him. It weakened him because of, of the greatness of the Lord and the magnitude of the Lord. So, in that, that verse, verse six, in that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends. You do not know how many times the Lord has been accused of taking care of the bad people while they were left untaken care of. You don't know how many times. I don't have any clue, but I have a little, just a tiny bit of clue just by being pastor of this church. How many times the Lord has been accused of, of giving more attention 
to the enemies than you do to us. More Joabs never understand the Lord. They never will. They never will. For thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither princes nor servants. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all we had died this day, then it had pleased thee well. Well, I got news for you. If they died correctly, I'm talking about the cross. I'm talking about being one with the Lamb. I'm talking about entering in to death the way David did when, when, when absolutely, you got to remember this man is cloaked in this reality. It is him. It is who he is. So here, here comes Absalom with all of his forces and they're, they're coming to destroy Jerusalem and to take it by force and they're coming to, to kill everybody that's connected with David. And so David just flees and he takes whoever will go with him and he does it to save Jerusalem. And he does it to save the people that are there. And he said, I don't care. I would rather lose. I'll enter into a death. But it'll be a death with the lamb. It'll be a godly death. It'll be a worthy death. It'll be from one, if it's chosen and understood and embraced and entered into, it'll be a death out of which there is a glorious resurrection. But there has to be that kind of death. There's just not life out of any death. A lot of people die and there's no life out of it. It's this death. And David knows that. And so he goes, you know, you know, you, it's like you would almost rather let Absalom live and everybody else die. That's the Lord's people. That's what he expects. That's who he is. It is. He says, let's all die. Let's enter into this death so that those Absaloms who are wrong and messed up and out of it may receive life. And, you know, and he looks, at, he looks at his bride as himself. Bone of his, you know, we, we say bone of his bone, da, 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 da. Well, I got news for you. Whatever heart he's got working in him, he's going to expect that out of us. Because he sees us as one. He, 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 can't, he can't treat his body different than himself. He can't do that. And he'll look at his bride and he'll say, be with me, let's go. Let's enter into this death and let's do it to the glory of God. But he'll be accused. Because that's not the way of the world and that's not the mind of man. But it is the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Every accusation, it sounds right. And we've, we've read it and we've stood with Joab and we've said, yeah, David, come on, man. Stop showing the heart of the lamb. Stop showing the heart of the crucified. Show us the heart of he who pardons, maybe, the one who will pardon us, but don't reveal, don't show. This is, this is Romans 1 and 2. Don't show us that which may be known of God, or we'll twist it and we'll pervert it. And we'll make Joab right. And we'll honor Joab when Joab was never right. And David had to deal with Joab his whole life. His whole life. I wrote, Joab says this is wrong, so David can't reveal his heart. He can't reveal himself as he is in his heart. David has to change his countenance to meet their expectations, but he does not change his ways, and we'll see what I mean when I, because he doesn't. He won't ch everything that comes from this point on when he wants that he's dealt with like this, he may, he'll go, he'll fold back in. He will fold back in to himself and he won't reveal what he really is 
for fear of, you know, messing with everybody, and he loves everybody too much, David doesn't. He's going to go, okay, if this is messing with everybody, I'll fold it back in, but these people should be with me. You know, I mean, David's men. They should understand this spirit by now. I shouldn't have to hide this part, but I will. But then he doesn't hide it. He manifests it in plain sight, but he manifests it now towards them, and they can't see it for what it is. They can't see it for what it is because it's just getting stuff from him. Pardon. Forgiveness. So, I don't even know where I am. I'm sorry, I'm so... Um, let me go on down to, anyway, so, so, David does hide himself as far as the crucified, the one who would take that death for him. But he does not appear before the people, and he does not get before them and say, I repent, I was wrong because he wasn't wrong. I, I shouldn't have done this. I didn't take thought of you. The problem is he did take thought of them, but his thought is within the context of the cross, of the Lamb. So he speaks to the general pop. He goes, sits in the gate, and he speaks to the general, general populace. Who is the general populace? Number one, it's the people that sided with Absalom, right? That's my car, stop it, oh yeah. The general populace, and it's the people that didn't go with David, and it's the people that didn't, when they heard the victory was over, they didn't call David back, and that's what the scriptures are saying. They didn't, why didn't you bring the king back? You know, why don't you say, come, come back. Absalom is dead, come back. <laughs> I think that's the first time I've ever seen that happen. Here, I'll do it. I've got several remotes on me. It's not mine, but remember, Jim, how I used to, my key would fit everybody's car. <laughs> we were in Mexico, and Wyman Pilot locked his key in the car, and I walked up with my little Toyota key, stuck it in it, and unlocked it like that, and I started using that key, and it was fitting everybody's car, and I'm going, the key of David. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> So with David, he doesn't repent, but he withdraws enough within himself so that they don't have to deal with the way he is. And he doesn't get up there and say this and that. He gets up in front of the people and he gathers them all together. Let's see if I've got it written here. He gathers together all of the people that were in rebellion or were still in Jerusalem without him. And in verse 12, here's what he says, starting in verse 12. Ye are my brethren, ye are my bones and my flesh. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Why then are ye the last to bring back the king? His view when he starts is based on one thing. Even though they were in rebellion, even though some were just passive, he starts by saying, you're bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. We are one. 
And then verse 13, and say to Amasa, art thou not of my bone? Again, here it is, and of my flesh. God do so to me and more also, if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the place of Joab. He's replacing Joab finally. I mean, why would he replace Joab if Joab was right? Verse 14, and he bowed the heart of all the men of Judah, even as the heart of one man, so that they sent this word unto the king, return thou and all thy, all thy servants. He bowed their heart, and they all were as one person. That's Jesus bringing us into oneness with himself, even in all of our junk and rebellion. The same thing that happened in Romans 1 and 2, the same thing the same thing that, that, that we call the gospel, but we don't see that David is saying, I would have literally died in the place of Absalom, and then I've got, the, they want it when it comes to them. They're getting, you know, pardoned. Just pardon us all, David, and we'll be together again, and we'll all be, just pardon. Oh, I forgive you. But David wasn't wanting to just pardon He's wanting to die because in death, really, you become into oneness. And then when you come up out of that together, it's him. It's not I, but Christ. That's the way Paul described it. <clears throat> I put in parentheses as wording of someone, I receive you in your sin. This is, this is David saying, I receive you in your sin, but you don't want me to love my enemies, to die in place of my enemies. You want me to receive you in your sin and your failure as your king, but please don't show us the lamb. Please don't die for your enemies while we're left you know, while we feel bad about not having the victory, is really, I mean, come on, people, is really having the victory and da da da, da all that kind of, is that really what it's all about? And I tell you, you know, this is one man's opinion. I'm nobody, I don't know anything. This church isn't big enough to say anything about me except I'm an idiot. But this one man's view is that shouting the victory after the defeat of Absalom is horrible in the eyes of the lamb because he would have died for Absalom just like he died for them. It's not a beautiful sight to him. If they're standing there shouting, you know, all glory to the lamb that was slain, that was slaughtered, because that's the wording. To him be glory and honor, power and dominion and might. Then he'll receive that, because that's who he is, because they have gathered to his heart, not to his work. I receive you in your sin, but you don't want me to love my enemies, to die in place of my enemy. So then, that's his first step after Joab says what he does. That's his first step. He forgives all the people anywhere that had anything to do with it. He doesn't go through the ranks and kill anybody. His second step, he deals with a man, I, I don't know what a pr proper pronunciation is. Again, I was born in Oak Cliff <laughs> or raised, you know. And, so I don't know. But I call him Shemaiah. And in 2 Samuel 19, verse 15. And this guy, some of you, pardon 2 Samuel 19, starting at verse 15. This guy, I'm not reading the story when they left, but when, when, when David was being driven out, when David, he wasn't being driven out, when David took those that were his to spare them and left the city and the people intact so that 
everybody else wouldn't be destroyed. He was willing to go through any destruction personally to save everyone else. When he left, this one guy came out, and he was, a, he was of kin to Saul, the king that was before David. And he came out, and he cursed David, and, you know, you know, this is so stupid. David is riding there with his mighty men. I mean, his mighty men are going to stick with David. And his mighty men are with him, and Abishai is always right there in front. My God, he's young, and he's got a sword. And this kid, and he's kin. I think, I think he's the brother of Joab, isn't he? If I remember, because I think he is. He's the brother of Joab, younger brother. And he is, uh, you know. And this guy is cursing and throwing dirt on David as he's riding out and mocking him and telling him what a wretch he is. Just like, you know, just like we do to Jesus but don't really understand how we're doing that. And Abishai says, you know, David, let me draw my sword and take this man's head off. That's so everybody else, not David. And David says, no. You know what David says? David doesn't just say no. He goes, you know what? Maybe the Lord sent him to curse me. Maybe I need to listen to this instead of fighting against and going, this ain't God, I've been right. I'm not, I'm not, you know, anything like Absalom or any of these people. I mean, I'm really, you know, I can't believe someone would think negative about me. I mean, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be misunderstood. This is wrong. This guy's, you know, this guy's been poisoned. Well, David goes, well, I don't know. Maybe the Lord sent him. <laughs> he just so, his heart is so with the Lord. Do you see that? Okay, so now David's coming back. And this guy shows back up and figures, I'm in real trouble. Right? <clears throat> Verse 15. So the king returned and came to the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to go to meet the king, to conduct the king over the Jordan. And Shemaiah, the son of Gera, Benjamite, who was of Barhurim, hastened and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. Wow, what? It's always saying king, king, king. All of a sudden it says, came to meet King David. And there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons and his 20 servants with him. And they went over the Jordan before the king, and there went over a ferry boat to carry over the king's household and to do what, the, uh, what he thought good. And Shemaiah, the son of Ger, fell down before the king when he was come over the Jordan and said unto the king, Let not my lord impute iniquity unto me, neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely the day that my lord the king went out of Jerusalem that the king should take it to his heart <clears throat> he doesn't know the king's heart he wouldn't even say that for thy servant doth know that I have sinned therefore behold I am come the first this day of all the house of Joseph to go down to to meet my lord the king <laughs> but Abishai it's the same guy who wanted to take his head off, coming or going. <laughs> <clears throat> but Abishai, the son of Zuriah, answered and said, Shall not Shemaiah be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? I mean, these, these, mighty, these mighty men of David, these mighty men of God, they saw Jesus in this man. They saw the Lord in him and they said, this is the Lord's anointed. And, uh, but they didn't see the Lord. They didn't see, his, they didn't see his heart. They saw God was with him. They saw God was on him. The scriptures say that we're to no longer know him after the flesh. 
Let's know him, not just after the flesh and what he can do or what he has done or what he will do for us. Verse 22, and David said, what have I to do with you, you, you sons of Zoria, that's including Joab, that you should this day be adversaries unto who? Unto me. Shall there any man be put to death this day in Israel? A bunch of people should be put to death this day in Israel. Do you realize that? It's right. It's just, it's not fair that they get off. We stood with you. This is, all this, there's so much. Our mouth is an open sepulcher. Our throat is an open sepulcher. We speak after the manner of men, and it's vile to the spirit of, of the lamb. It is not him, and it, it is the opposite of him, and it proves no matter how close we think we are to him or how much we think we love him, it proves that we're not one with him because we have not his heart and we have not his view and his mind. Shall there any man be put to death this day in Israel? For do not I know that I this day am king over Israel? Therefore the king said unto Shemaiah, Thou shalt not die. And the king swore unto him. Now this is the man that Joab said, you're not doing people right by your lamb spirit and your way of willing to die in place of your enemies. And, you know, this guy caused a lot of trouble. And David's, David's thought is, I, I thought you'd all be with me. I thought you knew me by now. But if you don't, he just closes up. And so now he's just pardoning. He's not, it's not Christ crucified anymore. Now it's just Jesus that pardons. I pardon Shemai. Next, or I pardon all the people that were in Jerusalem and all the people part of the rebellion. I pardon you. And they go, oh, he's so good. Just don't show that spirit of the lamb. This is good. Just pardon us. And I pardon you, Shemai. And next is going to be Mephibosheth. Time's almost up. So... So I'm not going to read about Mephibosheth, but it's the same story. I wrote, they see his benevolence. They never see his crucified heart. They see that he will pardon, but they don't know from whence it comes. Again, David wept and would bear the death himself for, for Absalom. They are, they are okay for him to show his pardoning side, but they don't want to see his crucified side, his death for ungodly. But they want him to show special favor to that which is yours. If I'm, your, if I'm bone of your bone, then do great things for us. You know, if I'm bone of your bone, then, then um, let's... Rejoice that this enemy is done, and let's all just have a great victory party. And the lamb says, if I didn't get a chance to die for him, it's not a victory for me. It's not a victory. I will turn victory into mourning. And we go, that's not right. And Joab goes, that's not right. We're going to shape this thing up. We've got to deal with this situation. I, because we've only got, well, I think we've got enough time. Let's turn to, back to Romans now. And if you think I'm crazy, I'll give you a scripture out of Romans that'll prove it. That I'm crazy. Romans chapter 9, <clears throat> verse, starting with verse 1. Romans 9, 1. This is Paul talking. <clears throat> I say the truth in Christ. He's not speaking truth, people. He's speaking what's in Jesus. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. 
that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Everyone thinks David was wrong in that story. And they think Joab was right. Over a couple more chapters uh, to chapter 11, Romans 11. I don't want to tell you, and if, you've, if you have not read any of my articles in my newsletter about the God who hides himself, you're probably missing out on some of this. But I went through Romans, particularly 9 and, and 11, particularly those two, to show that those those chapters are revealing God in a way that no one seems to see in Romans 9 and Romans 11. And they don't, they, all they see is stuff about Israel that they don't understand, and yet it screams the Lamb and the way of the Lamb, and the prophets wrote about it and they quote them all the time. And so here in chapter 11, he ends with having declared the spirit that Paul spoke of when he entered into it in chapter 9. And he, he developed this thing so beautifully that we as Gentiles now we are entering into a death so that they may come forth. Only the Spirit of God can open it, and in the meantime, just assume I'm insane and don't believe anything I say, unless the Holy Spirit opens it to you. But then he ends with in chapter 11, verse 33, and this is all he is, is swelling up and releasing something of the magnitude of this spirit that he has seen. And he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, judging I will die for Absalom, everyone else judging, we ought to be rejoicing. And his ways are past finding out. And I'm just going to read the next verse, and that's all. The others is good, really good too, but in context of what we're saying, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? Just that. That's enough. Just that. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Paul knew the mind of the Lord. And in Philippians 2, he said, let this mind, this spirit, this way of the Lord in his self-giving be in you. Look not every man on his own things. Stop it. Look on the things of others. And he goes through this, this, this spirit that is not us. It's not me. It's not you. It's not human. It's it only comes by being a partaker of the divine nature. And it's still not us. It's just Christ in us. And for something like him to dwell in us. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? So, I'll just tell you folks, I've just been undone. I am... I am in 
incapable to hold the fullness that he is. He is so beyond me. But I am shaken and humbled and joyful and always on the verge of crying constantly. I have been, have been. When Deb was gone, I went to one of recycled books, half price books, whatever. And I just picked up a book and I read one sentence and I'm, I just, it was just the Lord. And I shut the book and I ran out of there crying so hard. And I don't know, I don't know what's going on other than I keep seeing this stuff. It seems like I'm crazy, but I, I believe I'm seeing Jesus. I believe I'm seeing the way he is in his heart. And the bad thing is this time he's showing me the contrast of us. Romans 1, Romans 2, what a thing we did to him. Romans 3 and 4, what a thing he did back to love us and die. And then to see Joabs of this world come to David and tell him, you're just wrong. You're, you're, you're turning victory into mourning. And in his heart, he didn't answer back just like Jesus didn't before Pontius Pilate. He just knew he couldn't open himself up. So he shuts down and he just pardons. He pardons them all and he does it out of the same spirit, but they never catch the, that spirit. They never catch it. Romans 5 is going to really deal with this. It's going to really deal with this. But out of that same spirit, as long as it's a benefit to us, we receive it and we rejoice. But it's more rejoicing in the pardon than it is, oh my God. Who are you? What kind of person are you? What kind of being are you? And in Romans 5, we're going to see, we're going to see he assumed that we got it in Romans 4. I don't think we did. He's going to assume we got it, and he's going to just open his heart. He's just going to, he's just going to tell us The things that are important to him. So anyway, I'm sorry for the emotion, but I ask that you pray for me because this has been going on for a while, and it's it's just ruining me in a good way. Lord, we just come to you, Father, in Jesus' name. And Father, totally apart from anything I've shared so far in Romans or tonight, I just pray that you'll lead us past the outer court. We spent so much time out there. Just past the holy place of the things that we can see and touch and handle. And help us to see you unveiled. <clears throat> and help us to not just see you in terms of a deep revelation that you're crucified for us or we're your body or you know, we can come to a revelation of you, but that our hearts would be such that they would turn to you in a way that you understand, what you define as turning to you. And you'd show them your face and you'd show them your being. 
and we all would be changed into that same image. Father, you said through John, beloved, let us love one another. My God, let us love one another. Father, I just thank you for your grace and that you hear our prayers. Give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, we're just.